you are about to see a movie about the Centerville and Southwestern Railroad, located on the Becker Dairy Farm in Roseland, New Jersey. The railroad was started in 1938 and closed in September of 1972. It was very disappointing to many, many people, in Chuck, both adults and children, when this railroad closed. This is just a short shot of a Becker employees and family picnic about 1963. Now these are some signs that were around the ra on the railroad. As you see, the children, they charge 24 cents and adult 48 cents. There was also many signs about safety, such as not standing up in the cars, not sticking your arms out, not carrying lighted cigarettes, not getting standing behind the animals. They were all safety. But this is a ticket ticket office. And there is Pauline Becker, the original ticket agent. Now this is the early construction in 1938. As you see back in those days, uh, you used a lot of horsepower. This was the piers and bridge over the brook and Pig Pen Hill cut. first track was laid on cinder ballast. This, this was going out toward the horseshoe curve. This is the same area in April, two months later. The track has been laid. It's a long fill going around Horseshoe Curve and on your way out to Peach Street Junction. At this time, the Peach Street Junction was a Y, but there was no loop. So you went out, back the engine, or unhooked the engine, backed around, hooked on the other end, and headed back into the station. As you can see, there was an awful lot of work went into laying this railroad. Everywhere you looked, there was cows. coming out of the line and then heading back. Now this was a snowstorm in uh, 1940. That was the original 1500 engine. It was powered by a Harley Davidson 74 with reversing transmission. Now, as you 
notice the cows, they're fairly nosy. They like to see what's going on. They'll stick their head through the fence, see what you're doing. And this is a 1501 again, the original going apparently back into the center of Quite a bit of snow during that snowstorm. I guess they still want to play around with the engine or work on a track, but they sure spent enough time clearing the snow. This is March 1940. It's the arrival of the 1501. Retired president of H. H. F. Porter Locomotive Company in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. That gentleman that was in the tender was Floyd Becker, Gene Becker's father. Now this is the first time they got up steam and they had a problem with the pistons would not turn when it was when it was hot. They had to wait until it was cooled down. There the piston uh, problem was corrected. Mr. Ayers used bronze piston in case of too much water, the pistons would push over the piston rods instead of blowing out cylinder heads, which had happened several times. trip they discovered that they were using too much water before knowing any better when it was better than burning or blowing up the boiler the pink pen hill was three three and a half percent uphill followed by a two percent downhill making water level fluctuate greatly so they had to be very careful to have the right amount of water at all times. The ground sheet was high to get more heat out of the firebox. Now this is a widening of the peach tree cut. You see they're carting a little dirt out of there. This whole railroad had to be at the levels they wanted, so there was a lot of digging the dirt, removing the dirt. They find that they uh, are still carrying too much water in the 1501. Now this was June 1941. Alco Day, the American Locomotive Company. They were the ones who built the boiler for the 1501 in their Dunkirk, New York plant. It was the first all welded locomotive boiler of any size. A Delaware and Hudson was the next one.
Now this was another shot of a employee's picnic in 1950. Now in 1948, it was the first time that they started cha charging for, for passengers to ride the train. This was a siding where two trains would pass. We had it down to a pretty good science that uh, in many cases we didn't even stop. We slowed down, but we didn't stop. As you can see, all the conductors stand up looking over the train. Amazing enough, we didn't lose too many. Every once in a while, one of the conductors will take a spill off the train, but no one was really hurt. This is a full-size train that is coming into the dairy to pick up milk. Probably going to one of the other bottling plants. As you can see, they pretty well loaded these trains up. There was always people there ready to ride. Turning the engine around, back it up. That's the roundhouse in the background. Bringing the steam engine back down to load up to go out on another truck. This time there was no cover over the station. In later years they put up a roof over the uh, station which made it uh, a lot better in rainy weather or hot days. Now this in 1950, they are building the original loop at Peachtree Junction. They are connecting the two legs of the Y. As you can see, they had lots of equipment, lots of manpower. Here comes the stone, and rolling the stone, and dumping the stone. And this is the ballast car. They're spreading the stone along the track. track, lining it, rare tamping it, a lot of work went into just laying, laying this track, everyone leveling it up. And your nose right down to the job. a lot of tote, tamping, and a lot of stone. These were air tampers, forcing the stone down in there. You all 
also use the same ballast car and it was made air uh, watertight so that they could put chemicals in there to spray for weeds. As you can see on each end of the steam engine train, there were leather chairs. They were on there for a number of years. And then one day there was a slight accident and they were removed. That, in the white hat is Pauline Becker. She was the original She was the original person who sold tickets. There's some more cows, they're watching the train go by. Now the loop has been finished, then as you can see, going right around the loop. was one of the best parts of the ride, go, ride, going around that loop in the woods. This trip from station and back to the station took approximately 22 minutes. And you had to stay on schedule because the other train would be loaded and ready to come out of the station. If we ran three trains, we would run wide block signals and no, no particular schedule. Now this is the 1502. Gene Becker is the engineer. Now this is a vegetable stand where they sold vegetables every Saturday morning. Now you'll see this lady going out with her two bags of corn. There's 14 ears in each bag and the price was one dollar. It was the best corn I've ever eaten. And I haven't eaten any that good since the farm closed. The conductors got pretty fast to hooking that engine up. They didn't waste much time. They could get those hoses, chains hooked up, and they'd be on their way again. This is a uh, siding, as you can see, the trains are passing each other. That's Gene Becker running the 1501. Now coming into the station. We're into the yard, back in the steam engine down, under the turntable. And hooking it up ready to go again. They will be hooking it up in a minute.
putting water into the tender, this was done every other trip. And the alternate trips, everything in that engine was greased. This is Neil Vaness with the conductor's hat on. He was a man who worked for the Beltel. He spent practically every Saturday working there and it was all donated time. He just loved the railroad and just enjoyed being there. He designed most of the block signals and uh, spent an awful lot of work, work on those signals. Now you are about ready to see the last day of the railroad. It was September the 4th, 1972. Jay Gilso was the engineer on the 1501 and Bob Bennington was the engineer on the 1502. On that day we ran from 10 o'clock in the morning till 7.30 at night. People just kept coming, and we kept taking them out. We, the last trip, we added more and more and more cars until we finally had to put the 1502 on the tail end of it so that uh, they would, could handle all the people. And this is me coming around the curve, waving to somebody. As you can see now, all the cars have been repainted. They're all blue and lettered the, the way they are right now. On the last day, there was 2,300 people rode the train. 40% were adults. That's 2,300 people in one day. I would imagine that this was a derailment. I see that everybody was off the train, on the out of that car, and now they're getting back in. That happened occasionally, and you would have to get the crowbars and the blocks and put the car back on the track. That's, I imagine that's what happened there. In 1967, the new highway, Route 280, forced the relocation of the Centerville and Southwestern Railroad. That here is a bridge that went over a small stream around the loop going to Paradise Valley. Someone saw the camera, they started waving. This was the station, as you can see how the people were lined up waiting for the next train. Now here comes the 1502, coming back in again. And, he, and as you can see, these cars were loaded. 
both the 1501 and the 1502 loaded would carry anywhere from 100 to 120 people depending on how many children and how many adults. Now those were the block signals there that they would have been using if we were running three trains, which I imagine we were at this time, so I imagine Jay had green lights. time this last day we just got relieved for one trip Gene would take an engine I'd switch to the 1503 George Battle would take his lunch hour I'd go back to the 1502 someone Gene would take Jay's one trip so we could at least have a sandwich other than that we didn't stop all day long now this is coming out of the loop from Paradise Valley as you can see, you can see the other train, you can see just the smoke there for a while, and now you can see the other train. This wasn't planned, but it just happened that that day that the Sky Riders went across the sky writing, spelling out Pepsi. As you can see the planes up there. I'm sure Gene did not have that scheduled, just, but he took a picture of it anyway. You can see on the back of the coal car, the fellow that was sitting there, he is the fire, he is the fireman. He's the one that does all the oil. He's the one that fills you tender with water. This engine could not, coal could not be put on this engine when it was moving. They had to put coal on the fire in the station and they had to put it in out in Peachtree or Paradise Valley, they had to put coal in there. They could not put coal in while the train was moving. This was a pond that was right next to the uh, station. Usually there were ducks on it. Right there by the station, uh, there was a pipe that came up and then the most delicious spring water you ever tasted. It was not open to the public, but 
most of the conductors or whoever would jump over the fence and get a drink of water on a hot day. But that's all gone too. I think that spring now fills a pond for prudential. Thirty-two years, and it's all over on this day. Now this was the last trip. You can see how many cars are down there, how many conductors, and on the tail end is the 1502. Gene uh, decided on this trip that George Battis should run the 1502 as he was familiar with running the steam engine. So if you saw me there, I got a chance to ride conductor. Tell you the truth, it was kind of nice to stand up for one trip. But George was familiar with the steam engine. He had run the steam engine and Gene thought that it was better that he took the 1502 is he had more of an idea of what Jay was doing on the on the front. Now this is going around the curve at Paradise Valley. You see this was the carpenter shop. They had every shop, carpenter shop, blacksmith shop, lumber mill, everything. Wheelwright, they could make anything. Now this is a station, that's the end of it. No more people. It was the end on that, that day. Now this is a shot of the tractor trailer that will take the steam engine to the Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan. The gentleman with the polka dot hat is Gene Becker. This is Jay bringing the steam engine out of the uh, roundhouse. The wheels and the springs were blocked, so there was a good possibility that it could be derailed, is why they are going so slow and watching the wheels so carefully. Here's Jay hamming it up a little bit. Now this is a section of track that will go on the trailer and there's a section of the track that the engine will be located on in the museum. more track going on which will be used to take the engine into the Ford Museum which you will see later. Gene in the engine, probably for the last time. I can't say he looks too happy, but it's something that he wanted to do. He wanted to sell the farm, put the engine in the Ford Museum. That is 
Jean, again in the polka dot hat right next to him is Pauline, his wife, and the rest of the are people who work on the farm and the railroad. This is Pauline and Jean. Gene did not waste much time, anything that he did. Notice the picture was over, he started signaling to Jay, get the engine moving. He didn't waste much time. I don't know who had the polka dot, has the polka dot hat on now, but he must be somebody important. Gene let him wear his hat. And slowly the engine goes onto the track, onto the trailer. For its trip out to Michigan. That shows some of the specifications of the steam engine. As you can see, the locomotive traveled approximately 15,000 miles. Well, this is the showcase they're putting onto the trailer. It is the showcase that the engine will be in when it gets to Dearborn, Michigan. As you see, they have it pretty well wrapped up there so it doesn't get scratched up. Now they're taking a few ties with them. here and somebody wanted to go to Dearborn, Michigan, I'm sure they didn't bring them back. Now this is the glass for the showcase that's going on now. We're closing the doors and ready to go. Have a good trip. Be careful of my engine.
You will see a station wagon right behind this tractor trailer. And I am taking a guess that that was Gene Becker, who I understand followed the tractor trailer to the Ford Museum in Michigan. Now they are starting to unload the engine to bring it into the museum. The trellis they built there out of the ties, you can see why they had to take so many ties out there. Again, they are moving the train very, very, the engine rather, very, very slow as the wheels were blocked and there was no spring action. So they had to be very careful or it could derail. That's Gene in the engine. a little maneuvering to get the engine into the museum and get it located where it wanted to. As you can see it's sitting right next to some of its big brothers. Again, it's a section of track that it will be located on in the showcase. 
please turn the tape over to the B side. Thank you. Everybody seems to be taking his, another look at it before the showcase goes on top of it. I guess they didn't have it on the permanent track yet, but now they're rolling it up there. Gene Becker is attaching something apparently to the track. I don't know what it is, but it must be important or he wouldn't be doing it, but I would imagine it's something to keep the track from, to keep the engine from rolling. And they're now bringing the showcase over, uh, the one you recall you saw put on the tractor trailer Roseland. It's still pretty well wrapped up so it doesn't get scratched or marred. Carefully putting it down over the engine. Now to the point where they're putting the glass into the showcase. Gene is there working on putting the snaps in to keep the glass in. And here they are with the glass all in and they are cleaning the glass inside and out. And there it is in the showcase in the museum. That was its Supposed to be its final location, but the Ford Museum sold the engine to Mr. Monahan of the Domino Pizzas, who later sold it to Gary Cole, who presumably still has the engine. Now the remainder of this film will be a trip that Gene's father took in 1934 on the Pennsylvania Railroad to Baltimore, Ohio, the New York Central. The scenes are in Chicago, Cleveland, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and the Pennsylvania Railroad Bridge over the Susquehanna River. There are also shots of the 1934 Chicago World's Fair and in 1958 locations, possibly in New England. That's the end of the movies. That's the end of the railroad as it was in Roseland.